there's a reason why people have a subsequent entry in a series as their favorite, perhaps improved upon and fleshed out mechanics, better characters, or an overall well-paced story. But sometimes there's no better lightning in a bottle than the first game, the roots of a large tree. Look at New Super Mario Bros for instance, there's only so much you can add to later entries in the franchise that makes the new sticker pasted onto the title feel justified. But the release of this 2006 Nintendo DS 2D platformer was a major game changer, a blend of the old with the new with mechanics from the 3D games appearing here. Wall jumping, ground pounding, triple jumping, new power ups, multiplayer and actually being able to differentiate between Mario and Luigi on a 2D plane. Oof, what more could it have? Mega Man X is in the same vein as New Super Mario Bros in that it provides a much needed update to the series. It's more fast paced, sleek and carries a maturer tone. I mean look at X's face, he means business. Careful and constant movement is amplified further in this game and firing willy nilly isn't going to do you any favors. Later entries in the Mega Man X series have had their fair share of criticisms, but one remained prominent for all. It just couldn't beat or have the same impact of Mega Man X. There's something about the first Xenoblade Chronicles. When you look back at it with its sequels in mind, you forget about its novelty and what it did for the RPG genre. Despite its outdated graphics and at times gameplay, it's worth it when you consider how expansive and comprehensive its world and story is. What seemed innovative in Xenoblade Chronicles is standard now, but that doesn't make it any less good. There is a clear amount of heart and work put into this game, and it's definitely a must play for die-hard RPG fans who want nothing but a long, and I do mean long, campaign. That is, if they haven't played it yet. It's a bit sad to mention Final Fantasy Tactics. As a spin-off to one of Square Enix's most notable franchises, it has a satisfying, albeit difficult, turn-based battle system. Isometric battlefields that can provide advantages or disadvantages to both allies or enemies. The classic job system with about 20 classes to choose from, and this amazing quote. And don't sleep on the story either. The word hero shouldn't be thrown around lightly. If only the franchise got any sign of being resurrected. Dark Souls, Dark Souls, Dark Souls. What other game could have prepared a die edition as a subtitle in its PC version? You may think, with Elden Ring and its soon to release DLC, the first Dark Souls has lost its luster and popularity, but it unsurprisingly hasn't. There's a reason why people play the game with unique challenge runs. The replayability with the game is nuts. The numerous builds you can make with the differing accessories, weapons, and classes means there's almost always a new way to play the game every time. Of course, this is true for subsequent entries of the Soulsborne franchise, but what makes Dark Souls 1 special is that it had that to begin with. It was practically perfect on arrival of its complete formula, and welcomed being bent and dissected to find out more about what's hiding in its interconnected, and sometimes really gross, world. It hit the ground running and didn't really care to hold your hand as it did so. On the opposite end, here's Banjo-Kazooie. Not because it isn't memorable or anything, it just doesn't have, you know... Rare has a good track record with sequels, as with Donkey Kong Country, which makes Banjo-Kazooie's situation weirder. Banjo-Tooie, while great, has huge amounts of backtracking, and nuts and bolts is nuts and bolts. So, as a result, Banjo-Kazooie remains the majority's favorite, and it's not due to a technicality or nostalgia playing into it. Banjo-Kazooie has fluid gameplay in nine excellently crafted worlds, with a consistent charming tone throughout. This also applies to the characters. It was argued to be better than Super Mario 64 for a reason. Yoshi's Island is also in an odd spot. It's technically the sequel or prequel of Super Mario World, but also the start of the Yoshi franchise. That doesn't discount it from being the first game though. Yoshi's Island for the Super Nintendo is a cute, colorful, and unique game where Mario isn't the main character. The game is also one of the main catalysts for Yoshi's popularity in the Mario franchise, and it's not shocking to see why. The whimsical and creative art and level design does wonders for giving Yoshi his own identity rather than being Mario's sidekick or designated driver. He's a badass babysitter. Here's another tonal shift with Bioshock. Amongst the other franchises that came out in the same year, Uncharted, Mass Effect, Assassin's Creed, Crisis, and even The Witcher to name a few, Bioshock made a lasting entrance and impact with its narrative. Its environmental storytelling is a sight to behold and go through, such as the audio diaries, while maintaining its ominous and volatile ambience. Video games can be considered an art form, and the first Bioshock sets out to illustrate that excellently. 